Greetings, people of the world, as Electromagnetic Universe said in live chat. Um, today we're going to learn about Nara Narayan. Nara Narayan. So let's jump in and do it. Let's see here. Put this on the screen. And we'll go for it. So this is Bhagavatam, fifth book, fifth canto, 19th chapter, starting at text 9. We'll do, I think, 9 to 15. So it starts off with a prose statement. Bharate Pivarshe. Bhagavan Nat Bhagavan Nara Narayanakya Alka Akalpantam Upachta Dharma Gana Vairagya Aishwarya Upashama Upurama Atma Upalambhanam Anugrahaya Atmavatam Anukampaya Tapo Vyakta Gatish Charati so that means even in part varsha why even in part varsha because you remember the way bu is divided this is part varsha this tiny little bit down here so it's the lowest part of the earth so even in part varsha bhagavan is there even in part varsha bhagavan also it means narayan are, they're known everywhere, but even in, <laughs> not just in, in Bharata. Same with the other zones. Even in Bharatvarsh, Bhagavan is known as Naranarayan. To lead self-possessing people to self-comprehension and the ultimate infinite objective beyond the reach of time and imagination, he compassionately shows efforts that increase the power of morality, knowledge, and dispassion. So Nara Narayan are a very interesting avatar because there's two people. <laughs> In fact, there's almost always two people, but it's usually a male-female pair in any avatar. But here is just two males. Nara, which means the human, and Narayana, which means something about humans, right? Nara, Nara, Narayana, which means like the supreme person, the ultimate people, and also implies the source of people, the original person. So that's interesting. It's kind of, it's, they say that Nara Narayan is the same people as Krishna and Arjun. So Arjun is Nara, Nara Narayan. The purpose of this avatar is interesting. To lead self-possessing people to self-comprehension. Atmavantam is self-possessing people and then to lead them to atma upalambana to self-comprehension so a self-possessing person is a person that wants to comprehend and better understand themselves so uh, this term atmavat means a person that cares about themselves a person that wants to know who they really are so it's a broad term that can apply to any spiritualist or expiring spiritualist Nara Narayan is focused on those people and Nara Narayan's business is to help them get this thing that they want which is self-comprehension self-comprehension is in what sense there's so many different senses of self Self-comprehension in the ultimate sense. To lead self-possessing people to self-comprehension and the ultimate, infinite objective. The 
So what is the ultimate infinite objective? Avyakta gati. Avyakta gati. Avyakta gati means the goal which is unimaginable. Unknown. The unknown root of the self. It's beyond the reach of time and imagination. A kalpana. So kalpa can mean a unit of time. And kalpa can also mean a, an imagination, a function of the mind. So, a kalpana, antar, beyond the end of those things. So, in other words, what is the self? Well, today I'm this, and yesterday I was that. But what is the self that's beyond all of these changes that happen in time? In imagination, oh, what, what, what am I? Well, if I look at a picture, I can imagine that I'm something. If I look at a mirror, I'm imagining I'm something. If I listen to somebody else tell me who I am, I imagine I'm something. But what am I beyond all this imagination? That's what Nara Narayan want to explain to people how to perceive. It's not something that you can just tell somebody, but it's something that you can show somebody how to discover. So Narayan leads self-possessing people to self-comprehension in the ultimate, infinite objective beyond the reach of time and imagination. So to do that, he compassionately shows efforts, tapas, that increase the power, aishwarya, of dharma, jnana, and vairagya, of morality, knowledge, and dispassion. So, if we want to know, if we want to have self-comprehension beyond the limits of time and imagination, we will certainly need to make an effort. Tapas. Narayan came to display or exemplify or show what kind of effort would you make. That effort would have to have certain kinds of results. What kind of results? What kind of results will lead to the ability to perceive one's true self? Three things. Dispassion or vairagya. This may be the most important. Because passion or raga modifies perception. If you like somebody, then you overlook the negative traits. If you dislike somebody, then you overlook the positive traits. If you favor the right side, then you overlook the influences pushing you to the left. If you favor the left, then you, then you influence, overlook the influences pushing you to the right. If you like spaghetti, then you under you downplay the impulses to buy pizza. And if you like pizza, then you download the impulses to buy spaghetti. It's just the way preference or bias works. So if we're going to be able to see and comprehend the self beyond imagination and beyond the edge of time, then we are not going to be able to do that if we have bias. So we have to learn how to perform some sort of activities that would reduce the spontaneous biases. What kind of activities is that? That's what Nara Narayana showed. Jnana, the second thing you need besides vairagya is jnana. Jnana gives vairagya. Jnana means the ability to see things objectively, to perceive things clearly, to know things as they are. What kind of activities would you have to to really get jnana? Is it just about reading books or is it something else? And in order to be able to get jnana, you need this first prerequisite, which is dharma, which means integrity, sincerity, morality. Without dharma, you will not be able to understand jnana. Without jnana, you will not be able to have vairagya. Without vairagya, you will not be able to perceive things as they are. And if you can't perceive things as they are, then how can you perceive the self the way it is? Right? Good.
All right. Hello, Alf and Der Wolf and Sudvi and Guitar Cloud. Good morning, Allison and Rishikesh and Mary and Shabri Prashad and Paula and Electromagnetic Universe. Okay. Let's take a look at the next statumento. Oh, so let me just bring up this particular in kind, of, kind of obvious point. Nara Narayan are the deities that are in Bharata. Why? Because Bharata is the region where we exist. Now, it's going to seem weird because as I showed you, it looks like Bharata is the South Pole. But very soon in this chapter, it might even be the next text after the one that we finish on today. There's going to be an important astronomical statement about how this projects into smaller versions within each zone. So there's actually a whole boo, the entire globe of the boo is within this zone down here also. But anyway, the reason why Nara and Narayana are in Bharata is because Bharata is the Varsha for Nara, for humanity. And then who's the Bhakta? Remember, in every Varsha we have the Bhagavan and a Bhakta. Like previously, we had Ram and Hanuman, and we had Nishinga and Prahlad. So how about for Nara and Narayan? It's another person with a Nara name. Alf, you want to guess? Tam Bhagavan Narada Varnashramavapti Bhir Bharati Bhir Prajabhi Bhagavad Proktabhyam Sankhya Yogabhyam Alf. We are on fire with this text, aren't we? Tam Bhagavan Narada Varnashramavati Bhir Bharati Bhir Prajabhir Bhagavad Proktabhyam Sankhya Yogabhyam Bhagavadanu Bhav Upavarnanam Savarner Upadekshyamana Parama Bhakti Bhavena Upasarati Idam Chabikurnati Narayan Teach Sankhya and Yoga as a means to comprehend Bhagavan. Narada described their teachings to somebody called Savarnamanu. Narada adores Nara Narayana with paramount loving devotion and leads the residents of Bharata with this invocation. So now after this, we're going to switch to the mantra and then to some shlokas. But let's just look at this verse first. So previous thing said was, Nara Narayan, show how, what kind of, what kind of efforts would grant Dharma, Jnana, and Vairagya so that one can have self-comprehension, accurate, beyond imagination and beyond circumstantial things. So what is, what is the tapas? What is the activity? What is the effort? The effort is Sankhya Yoga. Sankhya and Yoga. So yoga is no yoga chitvriti nirod tada drashtu surupena avasthani. Yoga is the destruction of mental fluctuations or functions so that the seer or the consciousness can be situated in what it truly is. Because uh, vritti sarupya itaratra because the fluctuate the functions of the mind put the self in other circumstances and make it other things than what it really is so nara and narayan are one of the original teachers of the yoga system it's not original 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 it is brahma who will be mentioned soon. And yoga is the practical... So what's this thing, Sankhya Yoga? Yoga is practice, but the theory is Sankhya. 
So yoga is a practice based on a theory called Sankhya. Sankhya means delimitation, delimitation uh, or enumeration or discernment of different components of something is Sankhya. When you can say this has three oxygens and two hydrogens and that thing over there has one hydrogen and two oxygens or two, whatever it is, two hydrogens and one oxygen. And you can count the way things are composed and you can categorize things so that you can understand things clearly. Yoga is the practice that results from understanding the difference between Purusha and Prakriti. After you enumerate everything out, you find out there's two major categories, Purusha or the active principle and Prakriti, the supporting principle. And the self is the purusha. And then the yoga is the practice to comprehend that directly, not theoretically, but to, to experience it directly. Nara and Narayan are the original teachers of the system. That is later on in history, put into excellent codes by Patanjali in Yoga Sutra. So now enter Narada. Narada is the fan or the devotee of Nara Narayana. Narada, Nara Narayana are in Bharata because that's where the Naras are. He, he took what he learned from Nara Narayana and he taught it to human beings. Human beings are also, are, they're called Nara and they're also called mankind. From the word Manu. Or so we say. Savarna Manu. It maybe maybe it's a coincidence that these words sound the same. But the Manus are the per each epic, the Manus are the regenerators of humanity. So there's I think Savarna is the second Manu in the second epic of humanity. Narada teaches Savarna yoga and Sankhya. And then from Savarna Manu, the rest of the human beings come to know about it. Narada adores Nara Narayan with paramount loving emotion, Parama, Bhava, Parama Bhakti Bhavena, and leads the residents, Upsarati, with this invocation. Invocational is Abhigurnata, which invoke to bring something into being. All of these varshas, the, re, the way that the Bhakta deals with the beloved is to go closer to them at, by invoking them because love is union all right let's see if there's any questions we've got a couple of things going on here andrew ananda my guru dave says my guru Dave says that reading books is only meant to awaken inner transcendent gentle knowledge and realizations, not that we should depend only on books and bookish knowledge. Of course not. If you don't practice what you read in the book, then you don't realize it. It doesn't matter if it's about Atma Gan or if it's about baking cookies. But if you don't have the books, then what do you practice? This is what I tell people all the time about um astrology you got everybody wants to do research and practice and practical blah 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 but you can't practice something if you don't know what to practice you have to learn the theories first and actually everybody there's not an overabundance of scholarship let's face it there's an underabundance of scholarship and an overabundance of bozoship. Just clowning. There's just an overabundance of clowning in any field. And there's an underabundance of overly studied people. So there's no real need to stress very hard on the limitations of bookish knowledge. Hey, that's to just be mentioned, but it shouldn't be stressed on because people need to be encouraged to actually study the theory. Because without theory and theoretical bookish understanding, you don't know what to practice. 
And you're not practicing, you're just f- flailing and shooting into the dark. This is book five, chapter 19. And the text numbers are on screen. Okay. Let's see what comes next. So, yeah, so next is Narada's mantra. Om Namo Bhagavate Upashamashilaya Uparata Nat Uparata Nat Mya Uparata Nat Myaya Namo Kinchana Vitaya Rishi Rishabhaya Nara Naranaya Paramahansa Paramago Gurave Atmarama Dhipataye Namo Nama Iti Adorations to Bhagavan whose actions result from tranquility and who has no interest in non-self. Upa Rata Anatmaya Anatmyaya That word could be separated and make it a little easier to say. Adorations to the wealth of those who have nothing. The leader and the goal led towards the human and the supreme human-like, the supreme swan and the supreme teacher, the ultimate protector of those whose pleasures are within themselves. Adorations, adorations. So this is Narada's mantra. The first thing that he mentions about Nara Narayan Bhagwan is that the actions are Upashama Shila. The Shila or the actions and behaviors Upashama. <clears throat> Upashama means from someone who has no bias. Upasama means someone who has no bias. Upashama means someone who, therefore, because of having no bias, has no preference. Try to understand the way the mind works, and then you can also understand the moon symbolisms in astrology. The the moon and the mind, it works on opinions. We tend to think that the moon and the mind is emotions, but emotions are the end result of what happens in in the mind. The end result of lunar symbolism is emotion. But the foundation of lunar symbolism is bias and opinion. Now maybe you can understand cancer. The zodiac sign understood, uh, ruled by the moon. The foundations of lunar symbolism is opinion and bias. Strong preferences. They're not okay with things being just any way. They want and hope strongly that things will be a certain way. And they worry that things won't be that way. But that's not the nature of Nara Narayana. They must not have been born under the Cancer Ascendant or Lunar Sign. Because they're Upashamashila. So that means that their behavior is not indicative of any bias. Their behavior is indicative of tranquility, which is odd behavior, because if you go forward... Your, your, opinion, your biases give you opinions. Your opinions gives you likes and dislikes. Your likes and dislikes motivate actions. Hence the word is emotion. The likes and dislikes motivate actions with, which then generate results which are either satisfactory or unsatisfactory compared to the desires. And the satisfactoriness or the unsatisfactoriness is what we describe and feel as happiness and unhappiness which is the basic dialectic of emotion. The basic ends of the polarity of the emotional spectrum is happiness and unhappiness. If you just expand that out on different dimensions, you get all of the plethora of emotions that we experience. Future and past, you get worry and regret, etc. Or that's on the sad side of the scale, etc., etc., etc. So if you, however, don't have biases, how inclined are you going to be to action? Not very, because you don't care, really, how things turn out. But that's not the trait of Nara and Narayan. It's not that they didn't do anything. They do something. They're performing tapas. But the tapas is not performed out of bias and opinion. It's, a, it's performed out of lack of that. 
the desire to be unbiased and just true and just honest the desire to see things as they are motivates another type of action which is called upasan mashila and the, so this further described as uh what is it I'm glasses on uparata an atmyaya rati means love like like love like affection like um desire desire love like lust is rati uparata means they, they they don't have any more they don't really have any rati for anatma anatmya for things that are not self related related to the self because that's the interest and the purpose of nara narayan is to allow people who care about themselves to truly perceive the real self beyond the limits of comp- of imagination and and circumstantial events the true self and therefore they don't have they have rati for that so therefore they have motivation for that therefore they have actions directed towards that and they don't have actions directed towards anything else so in the pictures behind you can see they're not interested in clothing they don't they didn't well they do have great hair but this is just cuz they're fabulously healthy they don't have to buy the bonding masks and things that you and I have to buy the bring gel and so forth they don't care about their accessories they don't care about their wardrobe they don't care about their banks their neighborhood it doesn't concern them they're not motivated in that direction but they are highly motivated because they're performing intense action but their high intense motivation is to perceive themselves the self and to well to show people how this is to be achieved to perceive oneself but not in a circumstantial self okay okay there's there's another interesting thing really interesting thing See, Ananda Andrew says, I, I've mentioned this because the gurus at Iskan rely on bookish knowledge. Nothing could be further than the truth. They don't have any bookish knowledge at all. They have no knowledge. That's the whole problem. The next part of what he talks about is Kinshina, a Kinshina Vitta. This is a really interesting concept. Bhagavan is described as a kinchna gochara or a kinchna vittaya. A vitti is a wealth. Like if you have a nice silk pajamas, then that's a vitti. Or if you have a Lamborghini or Lotus or a Porsche, then you're you have vitti. You're very wealthy. You have something very luxurious. A necklace of pearls, etc., etc., etc. So people treasure those items. That's why they're called treasure, right? People treasure such things. Bhagavan is described as the treasure, or the vitti, for people that have nothing, a kinchana. This is the most incredibly crude way to describe Bhagavan. Because it shows that he's Atmarama Hari, that he attracts the Atmaramas. He doesn't, he doesn't, who you attract shows your quality of who you are. It's not just a numbers game, how many followers, how many subscribers. It's who are these followers? Who are these subscribers? Who are these followers? <laughs> so, Hari can attract the people that are not attracted to anything. I mean, if you can attract a drunk guy walking down the street, big deal. Any mop or sheep walking down the road could attract this uh, this drunk guy. 
in the middle of the night. But if you can attract somebody that has no no attractions to anything else, you must be incredibly attractive. That's how they describe Bhagavan. A kinchanaviti. People who have nothing, who need nothing, who want nothing, are described as a kinchana or nishkinchana. And the, what do they treasure? They're not the nishkinchana people who are envious and treasuring and wishing one day they could have a lotus and a Porsche. So I like that. Namo kinchana vittaya rish. And then he goes into this dual dual thing because it's Nara Narayan so he says Rishi Rishabhaya Nara Naranaya Paramahamsa Paramanguruve so these Nara and Narayan are appearing together because they're like a pair and also an important thing is he's showing this is this is an activity this yoga is an activity for human beings not just for Vishnu not just for big gods and Bhagavan for human beings so he came with Nara showed look Nada is going to do this with me you can do this too Rishi Rishabhaya Rishi Rish Rish like the first note of the musical scale is Rish it mispronounced in many cultures is Re Rekab but it's really Rishab Rishi Rishi means to come forward first to be the leader so the first note that uh, escapes, that moves away from sa, is rish. So anyway, rishi means a person who sees and therefore leads, or a leader. So the, sometimes it's translated as a seer, sometimes as a, as a leader. It's like the first beings that Brahma created are called rishis, sapta rishis. And then there's rishabha, which means the thing which is desired. The place that you would lead to, the place that is pulling you out to go, to lead, to, to leave, to go towards. So Narayan is the Rishabha and Nara is the Rishi. Narayan is the goal. Why? Because when you understand, how will you understand yourself? Yourself is an integral part of Narayana. So Narayana is as essential for the true self as the heart is for this bodily self. Heart and brain, etc. So Rishi Rishabha, Nara Narayana, the human and the human Ayana, the solstice of humans. Ayana means solstice. Why is it called solstice? Because it's the place that the sun moves to. It's the highest peak in the sun's orbit in any extreme. So it's called Ayana. The extreme peak is the Ayana, the place the, the, the distance travel to is Ayana, Ayanamsha. So Nara Ayana means the solstice of humans. Not the solstice of the sun, but the solstice of humans. That's Bhagavan. The solstice of pe- beings, sentient beings, is Bhagavan. Paramahamsa, Paramagurave. So Paramahamsa means the best swan, literally, and Paramagurave means the best teacher, literally. So n- n- Narayana is Paramaguruve, Guru, Paramguru, and Nara is Paramhamsa. Because the Hamsa is the exemplar. Also, one meaning of Paramahamsa is the type of a type of renunciate. There's a, there's this, the fourth stage of a sannyas is Paramhans sannyas. There's other stages, Kutichak, Bahuchak, Paribrajak. And Paramahans. So they lead up to Paramahans. So to say someone is Paramahamsa means that they've they are completely Upasamashila. They have no motivations for any action. So that's exemplified by Nar. But a simpler thing is Hansa the swan is exemplary. Because the supposedly the swan drinks milk right out of the water. If you pour water if you pour milk into the water, supposedly, or mythologically, or whatever, or maybe tr- truly, I don't know, the swan, when drinking the water, leaves the water behind, but takes the milk out of the water. 
And this is why Swan is considered a transcendentalist. Because they extract the self from the milieu of things that the self is involved in. So they extract the true self from the circumstantial self. It, that's symbolized by the swans extracting the milk from the water. And so Nara is a Paramahamsa, the best example of a transcendentalist, and Paramaguruve is Narayana, the best teacher of transcendentalism. Atmaram Adipataya. How did I translate that? The protector of those whose pleasures are within themselves. Atmaram, I mentioned before when it was a kinchna vit, when we were talking about a kinchna vitti. Atmarama is somebody who doesn't need you or me or any television show or uh, website or video game, board game, anything for Rama. They don't need liquor to get happy. They don't need food to be happy. They don't need sex to be happy. They don't need appreciation to be happy. They don't need respect to be happy. Their Rama or their happiness, their pleasure is Atma. It's self-generated and it's within the self. So this is a very high high quality of evolution. Evol- evolved person being is an Atma Rama. Nara Narayana, the Atma Rama, Adhipa. Adhipa, in astrology you always hear Pati, 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 the lord of such and such house is the Pati, the Adhipati. So what house is Nara Narayana lord of? They're lord of the Atma Rama house. They're lord of the people who are self-satisfied. So what does a lord do? A lord protects. Pat, pa means to protect and guide, and help, and support. Why would they protect the people? What does it mean that they protect the people? Because they actually give more bliss. What does it mean to be protected? To be protected, it means somebody's caring for you. It means somebody's concerned about your happiness. So Narayan and Bhagavan are described as Atmarama Adipati, because they're the ones who give bliss to Atmaramas. That's why they're Akinshanaviti. What is the thing that we treasure is the thing that will give us happiness so that we imagine will give us happiness. That's what we treasure and aspire for. So what would an Atmarama have have as an Adipati? It could only be Bhagavan. Stephanie thinks this sounds rather Aquarian. I'm not sure. What, you, what you're referring to. But it does, doesn't it? Because Aquarius is opposite to Leo. But it's, but it's really, what yoga is, is really the non-duality of the Leo-Aquarius axis. With, the, with Leo and Aquarius, you have on one side a self-confident and self-assertive person on the Leo side. And on the other side, you have a humble, cooperative, non-self-assertive person on the Aquarius side. So on one side, an Aquarius is like a non-self, and the other side is self. But Nara Narayan's whole purpose is to benefit the Atmavata. That is a very Leonine, Leonine trait, to be Atmavata, to be self-possessed, and to be self-concerned. To be concerned about yourself is a very Leonine trait. But this is the non-duality or the harmonization or unification or placation of the polarity of Leo to Aquarius is yoga and self-realization. Because the akinshanatva and the upashamatva, the lack of bias and motivation on circumstantial self, is what the Aquarius dynamic provides. But the perception and realization of true self is what the Leo 
dynamic provides. And the two of those integrated into a single experience is what yoga provides. Moments to home. So Moments to home said, can you do anything about Kamdev and Rati? Interestingly enough, we did that a couple of weeks ago because they're the they're the deities for the Western Division Ketumala. <laughs> All right, let's go a little. So, as always, every Varsha section has Shuka giving a pros, prosaic introduction to the thing, and then the bhakta of that varsha giving a mantra, and then the bhakta of that varsha explaining the thought process behind the mantra in poetry. So now it's going to switch to this poetry mode, where Narada, Gayatri Chedam, Narada is going to sing. Narada sings because he's very emotional. Bhakti, he's a bhakta. Narada is the chief of the bhaktas, and bhakti is an emotion. The emotion is expressed by singing, really. It's not really expressed by speaking in a monotone voice. Kartasya sarad gishu yo nabadyate. Unfortunately, not all of us can sing well. Nahanyate de hagato pidai hikai. Drashtur nadregyasya gunai vidushate. Tasmai namo shakta vivikta sakshine. He sings this. He is the animator of all this manifestation, etc., but is not caught up in it. Developing a body does not assail him with bodily concerns. Who is this pronoun referring to? See if you're brave enough to offer your opinion in the chat, because you might be wrong. Who is this pronoun referring to? He is the animator of all this manifestation, etc., but is not caught up in it. Developing a body does not assail him with bodily concerns. The seer is not polluted by the qualities it sees. Adoration to him, the impartial, distinct observer. Yeah, it's very interesting, this pronoun he. that it's interesting because what seems like he's talking about Nara Narayan. But he didn't say they, he said he. So who's this he? It's either one, and that's the important part. It's the Purusha. The Purusha, or the Atma, it can be either the Atma, or the Paramatma, or the Purusha, or the Param Purusha. It could be Nara or Narayana, and they say they have the same qualities. So you can read this statement of Narada's as equally as a description of the self and a description of the Supreme Self, Bhagavan. So let's read it as a description of the self first. What is the self? It's the animator of everything that goes on in, in Prakriti. Everything that goes on, for example, in your body, is animated by the self. So that's why the Latin word is animus. So, that's kartasya. Kartasya. Sargadishu. It's the force or the entity which is causing everything else to happen. When this force or this entity or this energy is not there in this system, the system just stops. It's like the body was growing for 98 years, it was growing, it was fixing itself, and then it stops. What happened that made it stop? Why did the heart stop? Why did the brain wave stop? Did the muscles get tired? They got tired before, but they got repaired and rejuvenated. Why not anymore? Because the animator left the system that it was animating. That's the self. Kartasya sargadishu yunabadyate. 
yet is not bound up within the thing that it is animating. That's the interesting or important thing to understand. You, I rented this house for six years, so I animated it for six years. I filled it up with my stuff. I made it perform my activities. It represented me. It stood for me. It took care of me and my family and everything. Now I'm going to leave it and go somewhere else, move to another house. That is not going to tamper me in any way other than circumstantially. The sizes of the rooms will be different. The amount of furniture that I can fit in here or there will be different. The type of activities maybe that I can do in the next house might be different than this one. But the actual entity that's living in these places is not altered. What is altered by your ability to live in different houses? The different kind of things that you can do. But the doer itself is not altered by the circumstances in which you live. You live in the burnt down Bronx, Bronx or you live on the edge of Park, Park, what is it, Central Park. Are you different? The stuff that you can do, the stuff that you tend to do is certainly different, but the person is not different. Hence, do trading places, Eddie Murphy. Take the, take, take the person from Park Avenue and stick him in the burnt down Bronx, which isn't so burnt out anymore. And take the person from the burnt out Bronx and stick them in 40, whatever, the 46th Street or whatever. And watch the behavior adjust. Guess what? Take your so-called wonderfully human soul and stick it in the body of a caterpillar and watch you behave exactly like a caterpillar. And take that apparently crushable, disregardable caterpillar and put that animated animated force inside a human body and watch them behave like Einstein. And then you think this human is so special. The machine is special. The human machine is special compared to the caterpillar machine, especially for doing certain things. But the animated force within the two is not any different. So... That's an important thing to understand what the real self is beyond circumstances and imaginations. Is, that's a really important point to understand. Hanyate means to hit or to kill something is hanya. So even though he's even though this person is put into deha which means a certain kind of confinement, a certain kind of a holder or a container. So a body is referred to as a holder or a container for Atma, Deha. They're, however, not pain, they're not hurt by it or pained by it. What is hurt or pained by being in different kind of bodily bodies is your tools that you're working with. If you give Jimi Hendrix a broken ukulele, or if you give him Madison Square Garden, then he's still the same Jimi Hendrix. What he can do with his instruments is different. Similarly, if you put a soul in a spider body versus in a bear body versus in the body of Leonardo da Vinci, what they can do with their instrument is different. But not who they are is not different. It's so important because we're constantly wasting all our time being jealous of other people. What is the, We're not jealous of the other people. We're just jealous of different kind of machines. So it's the same thing as being jealous of your neighbor's pool. To wish that you were as beautiful or as smart or as talented as somebody else is just the same thing as wishing that you had a fancier car than your neighbor. It's not really productive. 
So the be put into the body, so the body also dies, right? So that's another meaning of hanya. But the body dies, the body dies, but even when the machine breaks, the operator of the machine doesn't break. If all of a sudden the internet cuts out, then the, the, the machine that we're using to communicate breaks, it's finished. But I didn't die, nor did you. Daihika comes from the word daihika comes from the word deha. De, daihika means relating to the deha. So even though they're put into a body, they're not hit hanya by bodily de, daihika things. Drashtu nadrik yasya gunayar vidushate. So this is an important philosophical word, drashtu. It's in the sec- third Yoga Sutra. Drashtu is a way of referring to the real self. And the implication is this is the seer, the subject of comprehension. The agent of comprehension is the drashtu. The, drush, the agent of comprehension performs, or the, the agent of sight, the seer, performs what action? Performs drik. That's why we call aspects in astrology drishti. It's the sight from one planet to another. Drashtu nadrik. Oh, it just in astrology, let's say you have Jupiter aspecting Rahu. Is Jupiter tainted? by aspecting Rahu. Rahu is affected by Jupiter's aspect. Not Jupiter is affected by its aspecting Rahu. But you think we don't we don't feel that way. We don't feel this way. We feel like when my body is sick, I am in pain. If you cut, if you pull off my fingernail, I hurt. We don't feel that the self is not hanyate by daika. It's not harmed by bodily circumstances. We feel that the self is harmed by circumstances. Why? Why? Because we don't know what the self is. We have a circumstantial imagination of self. We imagine the self to be the bodily circumstances. We don't know anything else but that. Because the seer is not really an object of sight. So it's the seer is not really within the field of perception. Like when you play those games like Minecraft, with first person games, you don't really see your own face, do you? Like right now, I don't see my own face. I just see my glasses and a little bit of my hair and my hand moving in front of my face. So the seer is not really in the field of view. So therefore, we identify with the things that we can see. And then we see that we're animating these things, so we identify that that must be me. And so if you injure this thing, it hurts me because my emotions are invested in this. But it doesn't need to be that way. It's not ontologically that way. It's not, it's not fundamentally that way. It doesn't have to be that way. So this is saying the thing that you see does not infect you with its qualities. But that would go sort of opposite to our experience. Because if you see something oh, tragic, you feel miserable. And if you see something happy, you feel happy. So the quality of the thing which you observe does seem to affect you. But that's because we don't know what we are. The thing which we observe affects the tools that observe the thing. So for example, if you observe happiness, then the tool for feeling happiness is affected by it. The mental tool, the emotional tool the heart, the mind. If you see darkness, then the tool, like if people never, never look at, never see sunlight, then they go blind. 
if you if you see sunlight, then the tool for observing the sunlight is affected by by the sight. So tools are affected by what they interact with and what they see. But the user of the tool is only remotely affected insofar as they wish to be. It's not inherently affected. Like if your computer suddenly breaks, I kind of have a decision of whether I want to get really upset and aggravated and everything, or whether I just want to get up and go about something, some other business. It depends upon how much I have invested myself and how much habit and momentum I have of identifying with my computer, how much freedom I have to easily make a decision not to be affected by its condition. Okay? He's the animator of all this manifestation, etc., but is not... So that's reading this as the soul, but not caught up in it. Developing a body does not assail him with bodily concerns. The seer is not polluted... By the qualities it sees, adorations to him who is impartial and distinct from the as the observation. The asakta vivikta sakshi. Sakshi is somebody who witnesses something else happening. So rather than drashtu, the word sakshi is used to, to highlight the sense of the feeling of watching something else happen. And this is also called bodily disconnect, which can be very disorienting. That's why you have to pr- pr- practice yoga carefully, as not just haphazardly, not without book knowledge about it. You need knowledge about it. Otherwise, you p- might destroy yourself. You can destroy your brain by yoga. I think um, a friend of ours who you also know well recently told me that, um, I think it's Vyas Basa. On Yoga Sutra, he mentions that pranayama can destroy your health. Yoga can dis- literally destroy your mind. You have to do it carefully. Now, reading this as param purusha, instead of just a limited body, you just have a param deha. So the same the same dynamic which exists between me as a self and my immediate world and body also applies to Bhagavan as a super self and the whole entirety of matter. So Bhagavan is the source of all the matter but isn't in actually implicated in the affairs of it. I thought they were dispassionate, Nara Nara, and yet they are engaged in emotional singing. So you got that wrong, but actually it's an important question anyway. Narada is singing, not them. He's singing to them. Secondly, they are dispassionate towards anatmya. You have to understand this. If you just become dispassionate, then you won't do anything. Because passion motivates action. So they're dispassionate towards things which are irrelevant. That therefore passionate towards things which are relevant. That's the ideal. Whether it's whether you're a businessman or a yogi, business person or a yogi, that's your objective. You need to be passionate towards things that are relevant and dispassionate towards things that are irrelevant. So if you're a yogi, then the relevant thing is not the stock market. The relevant thing is self. Self, true self-understanding or quieting of the vrittis of the mind quieting of the distractions which impose identity onto the self so yogis are not dispassionate unless there are a few marginal yogis who are interested in just impersonal extinction of self the vast majority of yogis, yogis have to be highly passionate. And it's certainly all bhakti yogis are highly passionate. Next one, 13. Idam hi yogeshwara yoga naipunam. Idam hi yogeshwara yoga naipunam. Hiranya garbho bhagavan jagadayat. Yet antakale trayid nirguni mano, 
This is why Bhagwan Brahma explained that yoga mastery and expertise culminates in the capability to fix contemplation in you who are beyond qualification even up to the final moment while discarding the failing body. So again, what is you? What does you resolve to? It resolves to Nara and Narayana. Because this is another purpose of Nara and Narayana manifesting as Nara and Narayana. Self and super self are basically the same. They have the same quality. They're, but they're distinct entities who have a relational a relationship with each other. So this word you applies both to the self and to the supreme self. Bhagavan Brahma, who's the original yoga person, explained that yoga mastery and... Exp- so Bhagavan Brahma is Hiranyagarbha, Bhagavan. He explained Jagada. That Yogeshwara and Yoga Naipunna. Yogeshwara means mastery of the yoga and Yoga Naipunya means expertise in it. So you we get Naipunya from study and Aishwara, Aishwara by practice. You can't just practice and you can't just study. Bhagavati Jagadaya. He said that the purpose of both Yogeshwara and Yoga Naipunya is yet Antakali nirgune manu that the mind should be nirguna it should be fixed into something which is nirguna so that means has no particular circumstantial qualities to it so the mind the chitta vritti has to be nirod it has to be the, the functions of the mind have to be destroyed so that it is not absorbed in guna, circumstantial qualities, which, pr- which produce bias, which produce distortion of self. The only thing which is near guna is no object of sight is near guna. Every object of sight is guna. Every object of sight or perception has properties or qualities the only thing which is not have those gunas is the drush to itself the seer itself which is the atma and the paramatma nara and narayan tvai tvai nirgune mana yet antakale up till the very end antakale means to the end of time But the end of time is different for different people. My grandfather already had the end of time. So did my my wife's grandfather. He also had the end of his time much later. Soon will be the end of... Now hopefully not so soon, but at some point will be the end of my time. And then there's also the end of the universe time and all that stuff. All these things run on cycles, really, but within a small scope, you can see a beginning and an end. So that means constantly, the mind has to be fixed in the nirguna constantly by bhakti. Hmm. I didn't even put this into the translation. This is why Bhagavan Brahma explained that yoga mastery and expertise culminates in the capability to fix the mind in you who are beyond qualification the translation is missing bhaktya dadhi by giving it in bhakti so this what this is what stephanie was mentioning about dispassion if you're dispassionate you will not focus your mind on anything you have to have passion for the relevant thing So, and then there's the word dush, dush kalevara. So, kalevara is the body, the circumstantial self. Kala evara, kalevara. 
the temporal self, the body, when that is when that is ujita, when that is given up, means death. And the prefix on this kalevara is dush kalevara, which means that there's something wrong with it. So it it has two senses. It means when it's old and it breaks, or when it gets into a car accident or something, then it becomes dush kalevara, an unusable body, an unwanted body. So at that time, you have to give it up. Ujita dush kalevara, because you can't keep it to exist. It, it's not going to... It's not viable. That is the sense of antakala. At the end of your time, your mind was not fixed. That This is the culmination of yoga mastery and the culmination of yoga expertise is that when your body is going bye-bye, this means that all of your circumstantial definers for yourself are going down the drain, flushing down the toilet, going goodbye, getting ripped apart into a black hole. At that moment, you would be terrorized if you keep your investment of self into those disappearing, disintegrating things. But the culmination of the mastery of yoga is to have placidity, the culminating effect is placidity in the face of the destruction of the body because the body is incidental to the self. So that's one meaning of Dushkalevara is when it becomes uh, inoperable. The other meaning of Dushkalevara is that it's always not really operable. Like right now, I just have pain in my, in my left hip. It's not, this is douche kalevara. It's my own fault for my own behavior, but bodies result, bodies react to our activity. And so our activity is imperfect, and so the bodies become imperfect. So the yogi has two, they also have the concept that even right now, this body is not viable. It's not viable as an expression of myself. Not just pain in hip, but how about when you do, you look in the mirror and you don't like your nose, or your zits, or your whatever it is. You're too fat, you're too skinny. It's douche kalevara. It's not really expressing the self. So to have distance from that and placidity and focus on the true self, which is beyond such qualifications, is the Mastery of yoga according to Bhagavan Brahma. Teak? Good? Good, right? There's also some logic in here where, where he's talking to Narayana. When Narada is talking to Narayana, there's also some logic, is that in the previous statement, he claimed that Bhagavan is nirguna, that he has no circumstantial qualities. But then his proof of it is here, that the yogis focus on, on Bhagavan all the time. Okay, so that's like an additional logic. The next text. Yatai kikamu shika kamalampata sute shudhare shudhane shuchintayan sanketa vidvan kukale varatyat kukale varatyat yastasya yatna shrama eva kevalam. A person who lusts for earthly or heavenly pleasures is always in anxiety about their wealth, lovers, and children. If a learned yogi is similar, worrying about discarding their faulty body, then all their practices were nothing but hard work. So he's saying this is the test, the practical test 
of the advancement of yoga is that there is no pain generated when there is unfavorable conditions in your field of activity. Conversely, the people who have no comprehension of yoga or what it gives, they have ex constant worry about impending pains from even possible troubles to the things that are important to making them who and what they are. If your yoga has not removed that, then the only thing that the yoga is worth is burning some calories. Tanna prabho tvam kukale varat pitam tvanmayayaham mamatam adokshaja pindhyamayena shuvayam sudud bidam videhi yogam tvaina svabhavam iti O Prabhu, this body is faulty because it exerts power over our sense of I and mine. Kalevaram tvang mayayaham mamatam madokshaja. Ku kalevaram arpitam. This kalevara, the circumstantial self, it gives the ability for maya to arise. Maya means misperception. When you don't see what something really is, or you mistake something for another, that's described as maya. That's the definition of the term maya. When the worst thing for maya to affect, I mean, it's not such a big deal if you see a apple a 15 inch Apple MacBook Pro and you think it's an Apple 13 inch MacBook Pro that's Maya but it's not a very you know big deal who cares it doesn't have a big impact on you you know similarly you might see I don't know your friend and think he was your enemy or your enemy and think it's your friend and that's kind of makes a little bit of a more big deal that's another kind of Maya you mistake something for being something else but what is it really the ultimate problem if maya affects? If it affects the definition of the word I. If maya affects the definition of the word I, that's a huge problem. Because then it affects everything. Because based on I is mine. And mine is the motivator for all of the actions and emotions. So if maya affects I, then maya affects everything. And what the body does is it acts as a focal point for circumstantial qualification to define I and give a misperception of what I is. Tam ku kalevararpitam tan maya yaham mamatam body is faulty because it exerts power over our sense of I and mine. Oh, adhokshaja. So what does that mean? Adhokshaja. Adha akshaja. Adhokshaja. Aksha is the eyes or the perception. Ja means created by. Akshaja is something created by perception. Um, experiences. Sens sensorial experiences, sensual experiences, is akshaja, adhokshaja, something that belittles sensory experiences is described as adhokshaja. So the premise, the Vedic premise, is that is not that sensory pleasures are small. It's that there's something huge which dwarfs them. Just like the earth is not small, the earth is huge, yet the sun dwarfs it. Similarly, the happiness of respect, the happiness of, of having people like you, the happiness of sexual intercourse, it's big, it's like the earth. 
but there's a, other realms of happiness, according to the yogis, according to the Bhagavatam, which are like the sun in comparison to the earth. They dwarf those things which are actually quite big. So that's the concept of the word adhokshaja. Bhagavan is such an, a, an entity that any kind of experience or interaction with Bhagavan is like interacting with the sun in terms of the size compared to the interacting with the earth. So he's naming Bhagavan in this way because that's the kind of gravitational force that can pull you out of one orbit and put you into another orbit. So we're currently, our, the sense of I is currently orbiting bodily circumstances. A dokshaja is an entity that can has the gravity required to pull the sense of I out of that orbit and put it in a new orbit. So then that's what he's talking about. He wants bindhyama. Bindhyama means to be pulled away from something, separated from something. Let us be split. Ashu. Very quickly, let us quickly be split from what is sudurbhida, bindhyama, yenashu vayam sudurbhidam. This thing which is impossible to split from. I cannot split my sense of self from what I am. I can't really, I try, I wish, I envision. But it always is like a rubber band that snaps back into the shape of a 52-year-old guy, etc., etc. Lives in Japan, blah, 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 this hair, that color eyes, this kind of uh, intellectual background, blah, 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 blah. All the circumstances of the self define the self. And no matter how you try to pull out of that orbit, you come back to that orbit. That's why it's called sudurbitam. It's difficult to get out of that construct but Narada is saying may we get pulled out of that orbit very quickly by a dokshija and then if you get pulled out of that orbit do you want to become just like a deep space object floating through deep space but to have an orbit is important to have a center is important to have a focal point is important do you want to just be disembodied like a ghost no. You want to be pulled into a superior orbit. Videhi yogam tvayi naswabhavam iti. Yoga means to be linked with something. Yogam tvayi means to be linked with you. So instead of orbiting circumstances, of the self should orbit Bhagavan. And Bhagavan should. Adi- Identify and define the self. The relationship to Bhagavan is what should identify and define the self. It's not any different than how the relation to the body currently identifies and defines the self. It's just better. Because Bhagavan is not a circumstantial entity. Nor nor a fallible one. Nor one produced by mistakes. So Narada says, let it be swabhava, which has two meanings. Let it be our swabhava. Let our swabhava not be defined by the circumstances of our being, but let our swabhava be defined by the fact that we have relationship and relevance with the Supreme Being. You can try that. It feels great, even just to uh, imagine or pretend that you have that sense. This is how Prahlad Maharaj was able to get run over by elephants and not get crushed. Because of that swabhav of relating to Bhagavan and having the nature of Bhagavan as his own nature. So swabhava means that it's just as natural as anything else. It's the nature of consciousness to identify itself by what it perceives. So what yoga is striving for is to grant consciousness the ability to perceive the true reality, the true self, rather than circumstantial manifestations of that. All right? That's the 15th text, which is the end. 
after this, the Bhagavatam and Shuka will return to more di- very directly astronomical discussions. So this is the end of that, that whole section of philosophy in the midst of this astronomy. So whether you look forward to that or feel sorry about that, or both at the same time, that's up to you. So there's going to be a, an extremely important verse that comes next, but we already covered this in previous live streams about the dark matter concept and the different planes of Boo, the different realms of Boo. So if there's not anything else, then we'll call it a day. Let's see what else you got going on here. TK. Thank you, everybody.